right, everybody. We're uh, back at it after a short break. Um, so previously in our jam, we discussed that we wanted to have a character that could move around. Ultimately, what that turns into is we click on a spot and our guy walks around. Now, last time we had it working on just a basic uh, square mesh. But um, as we recall, based on our, uh, our scene here, let me go and look for it, sorry. Uh, Was it here? No, let's just go find it. One second, let's go here and search for it here. must have closed it. We'll open it back up. So um, let's go to uh, Google Jamboard. Jamboard. I should have my Google Cloud one. Let's go here down to Jamboard. All right, looking at our Jamboard that we had before, we've got a scene and you know, it's pretty abstract of what it's going to look like. We have a, you know, a guy sitting on a guitar, a tent. You know, we have some good ideas, but we don't really have the layout rigid. You know, uh, we're all working on our own things. And even as, even if we were to say right now, we draw out a picture and say, this is exactly where the tent's going to be and how big it's going to be and what the position of it and the, the footprint of it's going to look like. Later down the line, we're going to find out, eh, that sucks. Let's rearrange it. So there's no use in us coming up with a single um design for this scene and then going that's it no changes so we want to create a workflow where uh, myself or others on the team you know in a more formal game dev process you might have a technical artist or a, a level layout or a scene layout artist and you want to make it easy enough for changes to happen in the scene without having to go to blender and rebuild the whole scene from scratch and bake it in uh, and go from there now you might want to do that in the long run but for a game jam, something where you want quick iterations and, and a lot of changes and you want to be able to um, see something right now as opposed to having to go through this entire workflow with Blender, you want stuff to occur right now. So what we're going to do is we're going to take care of CSG messages, or messages, CSG meshes, and we'll just go to the page on that, good O CSG mesh, and it is constructive solid geometry. So in meshes and a lot of other things, you have very simple operations. Um, specifically, the ones that we're looking at here is we have things like union, which is an addition of two meshes, intersection, which is the only the area where the two meshes interact, and you even have subtraction. So um, subtraction would be uh, effectively removing a mesh from a particular uh, from another mesh. So let's suppose we go back and we have our terrain now. Right now it's flat. But in the future, we might want to um, we might want to make that terrain more interesting, some bumps and stuff. But um, once we bake in the terrain, uh, we want the nav mesh to have things like walking around the tent or walking around a tree. So we don't want to have to force ourselves into constantly rebaking this mesh and then rebaking a nav mesh on top of it. Very elaborate profit, uh, process for something as simple as like, oh, what if the what if it was moved over here? What if it was moved down there? Um, what if we rotated the tent a little bit? How would it look uh, in that way? You know, minor changes shouldn't result in a lot of workflow, uh, especially when you're really trying to make something that's tweaked just a little bit to look the way that you want. So to do that, we're going to take advantage of these CSGs, these uh, Boolean operation on the meshes, and we're going to come up with a, a method to quickly change our nav mesh to match. So let's uh, let's pretend that we've got a scene and we want some, oh, why are you upside down, buddy? Flip it back up. We've got a scene where we've got some really simple stuff, like there's a tree. Um, what I'm using here are actually some of the free assets from Kenny uh, Game Art, Game Assets. Um, if you're starting out or you don't have an artist, they're a great uh, place to go. They're also great for programmer art or temporary art. So I can just kind of go and I have a pack for nature and I've got a bunch of models. One of them is some trees. Um, but I'm going to look for tent. Let's grab a tent. 
and let's put the tent in the scene. So uh, tent's very simple, uh, and honestly, it's most of these things are much better than anything I could do. And you can see the meshes are all messed up. Their origin points are weird. They don't have any uh, textures or, or anything to them. Um, I'm not really concerned with that right now. Later down the line, once we have actual art assets for these guys, we're going to be able to uh, fix that. But for now, uh, I'm just doing things very simply and quick, and I just want to be able to make sure that I can set things up in a way that when my teammates go to work on this, they're not stuck um, waiting on things. So, unfortunately, this guy's being a pain. There we go. Okay, so now that we've got a tent here, and let's get rid of... Uh, oh, sorry, I did this wrong. All right, so we've got uh, this thing set up in a, in a slightly different way from before. We still have our, our navigation uh, object. Um, it's still the root of the uh, the root node of the scene because I'm in my test scene. Uh, later, it wouldn't really be the root, um, but for now, it's going to be the root. And we don't need this guy. We still have our camera and our character and our immediate geometry for drawing the line. But we now have a navigation mesh instance that's sort of the child of the spatial. So when we add the navigation mesh instance here as the child, what it needs first is a nav mesh. So before, what we would do is we'd add a nav. Uh, mesh and then we bake the nav mesh from it we're going to kind of go the opposite direction we're going to have a navigation mesh and we're going to say hey navigation mesh let's add components to you and then bake a, uh, a nav mesh from it now when we position our scene out here and these things are attached to each other which is wonderful um, we might have a scene that has our tent and our tree and uh, you know fireplace or whatever we might have these things here and once we, once we kind of have things laid out the way that we want, uh, we kind of have a few options for how we want to build the nav mesh from it. Um, the easiest way is instead of building all these things um, from the root, we go to the nav mesh and first we add our uh, CSG combiner, which is just something that acts on those Boolean operations. And we'll put it as a child of the navigation mesh instance. And then we can move our tent to be a child of that. So the CSG combiner now has a tent. We also want to give it the ground, which is just a big flat square that I made. So we've got the ground, we've got the tent, and for now, let's just float these guys away and get rid of that guy, and we'll get rid of our old terrain as well. We'll just rename this to terrain. We could have just moved it, but terrain. We have the ground and we have the tent. Now, the tent is just a regular mesh. This ground is currently a CSG box. So that is a, a box that can apply those Boolean operations onto other things within the CSG shape. Now, we just have a regular mesh, which means it doesn't really play in the same, uh, it's, not, it's not playing nice with those uh, CSG shapes. So what we're gonna do instead is we're gonna add a child known and we're gonna call, or we're gonna create a CSG mesh. CSG mesh is a CSG shape that can take a mesh, which, hey, look at that. We have a mesh right here in mesh. We have a tent. Um, let's get rid of the old tent. So this new tent still exists, but we can also tell it to use the subtraction. Oh, and that's because this shape is all weird. Let's see if I can uh, invert the faces. Uh, this isn't a very good shape, and that's, and that's kind of going to lead to me my next point. This shape's a little odd, so we're kind of getting some uh, artifacts here. Um, so what we would do instead is instead of having this mesh that's been imported um, like normal, what we could do uh, on the other hand is use a uh, like a footprint mesh, a very simple, maybe even just a square footprint um, like I had before that matches the size of it and is tied to the, um, the position and orientation of it. But for now, let's just use this mesh and we'll see what uh, kind of weird things happen. Let's maybe scoot it down a little bit. Or uh, Let's just do that. Like I said, it looks weird and that's because we're not using this the way that we should. But um, we'll worry about fixing that later. In general though, you can see we kind of have a square cut out of this mesh. And so that's what we're looking for as far as walking around the mesh goes. So let's see what happens when we do this. So we have the ground, we have the CSG mesh, which is the tent into it. We're now going to go to the navigation mesh instance, not this one, the one that has children, and we're going to click bake nav mesh. 
now it's baked our navigation mesh. So before we used to have a mesh instance and tell it to bake a navigation on top of it. Here we're going to have a navigation and say with the children geometry that you have, the mesh geometry below you, build a nav mesh. So um, it's not perfect. You can see there's some space here at the bottom. That space at the bottom is, uh, you know, there's not much we can do about it. And honestly, in our case, it's kind of a good thing because if you think about it, somebody walking around a tent, they're not going to walk as close to the tent as possible. They might give a little uh, extra space around it just to make sure that they can reach it. So now we can run this scene. And we have our scene. We have our player walking around. But if we try to walk to the other side of the tent, we can see that they walk around the tent instead of walking straight through it. So once again, we have those artifacts because we're using the wrong mesh. What we could then do is instead of using this mesh with a tent, or we could have a, a mesh instance, if you're having complex shapes, you still want to use a mesh. But since this tent has a square footprint, instead, we're going to delete that mesh. We're going to move the tent back into the scene. Let's say we want the tent right there. That's a nice spot for the tent. We'll move the tree uh, somewhere else. So now we've got this tree and this tent, and they're both sitting here. Now the tree is interesting because the tree's base is actually much smaller than the area you'd want to put around the tree. So in this case, the tree itself isn't a good representation of its footprint because the, the upper side of the tree, you know, the part that you walk around is actually off the ground. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to go back here. We're going to add two CSG boxes and we're going to position them to match the position of our objects and we'll shrink it to match the footprint that we would want if we were to walk around the tree. So it doesn't have to line up perfectly because keep in mind, um, people are going to want to, you know, they don't want to run into the tree, get covered in pine needles, uh, bump and get their jacket dirty or something. So we kind of make a rough footprint of this tree and we want to make sure that the box goes through the navigation mesh and then we'll tell it to be a subtraction. Um, oh, uh, let's flip it upside down because orientation is important. Sometimes they get upside down. Don't worry about it. If it doesn't look right, make sure you flip it. But now we kind of have this hole cut out of the, the floor where the tree lives. Likewise, let's duplicate this box. And once you go in, make sure you have uh, more appropriate names for everything. But we're going to do the same thing. Let's expand our box out. Uh, it's a little too wide. Let's do it something um, closer like this. And then let's scoot it over, expand the box. So now we kind of have this gap in the navigation mesh that is appropriate for our, um, for our navigation. Um, now, keep in mind, if this was the final viewing mesh, you would run into issues where you just kind of see holes in the floor where this navigation mesh is. So you would actually apply a non-navigational mesh on top of this, you know, kind of paste it on as a, like a, a costume almost. And then that's what the player would see. But as far as the logic for navigation goes, um, it's using this mesh with these footprints cut out of it. Next, we can go back and let's bake a new nav mesh. Now we see have a nav mesh with the new holes. Let's run it. Here we are. Um, just for the sake of viewing, I'm going to switch the camera to use our editor's camera. So that way we can kind of look around uh, and get a, a sort of top-down view. There we are. And as we click around, the clicking is weird because we're, we're using the base camera for our click. So the, the vector is being sent in a weird spot. But I can kind of drive it around here just by looking uh, clicking randomly. And we can see that the character appropriately moves around our tent and our tree. So by doing this, uh, maybe I can disable this. By using this, we can sort of set up an environment where it's fairly easy for us to create a new mesh without going through the full mesh creation and, and baking and then generating a new nav mesh on top of it. So as far as rapid iteration goes, it's pretty easy for me to say, oh, hey, if you want to try moving, oops, if you want to try moving that tent around, uh, just click on the tent, uh, pick a new spot, click on the tent footprint, move it along with it, and you're good to go. Um, another thing we might be able to try is um, in this train, actually, let's just try it right now. In this train, so it would be nice if the tent itself 
and the box move together. So we have the box and we have it set to subtraction. So it looks like it's still not working, right? Um, by that I mean um, it doesn't consider the tent, uh, the CSG box under it to be part of the tent, um, or sorry, under, under the terrain so that they cut from each other. So this might not be the most appropriate way to do it, but for now, we at least have a, a way for us to say, select these two things, move them together, uh, rotate them together. And hey, look at that. We've got our, uh, our things in the new position. Now, if we don't bake a new mesh or a new nav mesh, um, we're still gonna run into trouble because hey, I can click here and the player just goes through it. And oh, hey, for some weird reason, they're avoiding that spot. So we would just go back Make a new nav mesh and run the scene again. And here we go. The player is avoiding the tent. So, yep. Um, just wanted to show that real quick in a sort of a smaller uh, picture here. Um, what we would do next is work with the artist to come up with a rough overview of how the uh, scene is going to look. And then um, from there, we would go ahead and um, start building things out, getting it to look the way that we want, and have things acting with each other. Now, um, now that we have this, there's not much I want to work on. I don't want to create meshes, and these aren't the final meshes by a long shot. Um, what we kind of want to do is we know that we're going to have a campfire. Let's see if I have a campfire. Um, I don't. Oh, there we go, campfire. Let's just sneak this campfire in here. Once again, I'm just using these purely because, where are you? There you are, campfire. Purely because I am not an artist. I'm not even remotely an artist. And the only thing I'm trying to do here is make sure. Oh, I see it's got a little base to it. That's why. Um, make sure I can lay things out and get it to work well. So once again, we have uh, a campfire here. We don't want the player to walk into the campfire. Let's add a new. Child node, box, shrink it, doesn't need to be huge. And then we'll move it. Oh, that's what they want. That's what that's about. Move it about here. And then subtraction. And hey, we've got a nice little spot to move around. Now, I don't have to rebake the nav mesh right away, but honestly, it's so easy to do. You just click and you're good to go. But now we want to play around with a few other things. So when we play the scene, we'll notice that it's just kind of a blue wasteland. Um, we want some nicer things to go around and um, make this look like a, a real environment that's alive as opposed to the static wasteland thing that we're looking at. So. Um, to do that, first we can turn off the navigation mesh. We would probably want to have another mesh uh, similar to the navigation mesh in shape so that um, we can have something nicer to look at. But for now, let's just pretend that our, our nav mesh... Actually, you know what? Let's add a new one. If we can do that easily, we can just add a new child of mesh instance. We'll make it a, a plane, and we'll scale it up. That's probably big enough right there. So now we have the navigation mesh is hidden, but it still exists. The navigation is, you know, underlying navigation engine is running. But we now have a nice little uh, mesh that's a little too low to the ground. Let's move it up just, oh, who am I talking to? No, not that guy, this guy here. And eventually this would be an actual mesh with some texture to it and some other stuff. But next that we're gonna do is let's add a, uh, I think, world environment to it. Uh, this requires its environment, environment to have a, so environment, let's make a new environment. The ambient light, let's make it a very dark, actually, let's leave it black. There's no ambient light. Um, so the world is pitch black, right? There's no light in this world. So all we're going to see is pitch black. Now the background is colored, but eventually we would uh, mask that behind some sort of a texture. But there's no light in this world. It's it's a horrible, horrible place to live, or, or uh, it's at least a very dark night in the middle of the woods. So that's why we have a campfire. Let's add a light. It's going to be a uh, 
omnilight. That is something that produces light in all directions, which is conveniently a lot like a campfire. And I mean, we can even move it around. Hey, we've got what looks like a little campfire light. Let's move the color to be something nice and warm. Uh, how about, there we go. Increasing the energy, it's a little too bright. Uh, I don't know what indirect energy does, so let's forget that. Specular, don't know. Um, I'm not a light expert, so we're gonna be trying to figure this out. Uh, we want it to produce some shadows. Um, lights, although technically the base of the fire there, the light would kind of be above it. And we can produce this, but as you can see, it kind of has a maximum extent there. So we're gonna scale it up. <laughs> it gives a really weird effect there and turn down the energy quite a lot. So now at least it covers a lot more of the space. Um, even having it up more, it does kind of give weird shadows. Um, but we can always just keep scaling that up. I mean, the scaling is gonna be pretty big because we want it to be a very soft light that affects a large amount of the scene. So, um, yeah, I don't think that does anything. Not that I know of. Uh, we can have it suck light out of the environment. Uh, we're gonna keep the energy relatively low and also keep the indirect energy, uh, well, not indirect energy, the scale enormous. So that way, a little bit of light goes a long way and casts some very long shadows, but um, it's not gonna be something that looks like you're getting burned alive by this enormous fire. So hey, even from this, we've got a guy walking around casting shadows. Um, that alone, I mean, that, that looks way more alive than the scene was just briefly ago. Um, which is really great news for us. So we've kind of got a few of the major components of this scene already. We've got a lighting engine set up in a world environment. We've got a campfire that produces some light for us to see. And we've got a character who moves around. Now, there's going to be a lot of um, fine tuning required in this project. Um, when somebody's moving around their campsite, they don't usually float around like this weird ghost person and... Uh, <laughs> and turn around instantly and, and all of that. Oops. Uh, they're gonna walk a bit more like a human being. They're gonna turn around. They're gonna uh, have animations. They're gonna not be a cylinder. So a lot of the work in this isn't gonna be like the base functionality. It's gonna be making fine tunes to make the environment nicer. Um, one thing that we can do to make the environment nicer is we can make this um, fire light. In fact, we want the fire light to be relative to the campfire at all points. So if I happen to move the campfire around, so does the light. This fire light, let's attach a fun script to it. We'll bake it in for now. And what we're gonna do is very simply, we'll do set process to true. And we're gonna make a very basic flickering light. In fact, there might be a, something you can download from the asset lid for this, but we're gonna make it ourselves. Um, the more you can do yourself is gonna be a much better learning experience. Um, and you're gonna understand more about how to do these kinds of things if you need to do something that's sort of like it, but not quite. So we're gonna do func uh, process. Remember we have to have the delta included, luckily the auto completes for us. And we want to flicker our light. So when we flicker, uh, pass. When we flicker a light, looking at here, there's an easy way we can flicker. We can change this. That, that's a nice flickering light. Now the intensity of it's of course gonna need to be, um, uh, you know, fine-tuned. But I think another thing we could do is flicker this scaling here. And so imagine this is a larger radius, but it'll also light things up further away. Um, and come back. So I think we want to be able to scale, uh, edit those two things, the scale of it, or the light radius, where's light radius? Excuse me. Oh, right here, there we go. Even better, these are the things I was looking for. So we can change the range of this. We can also change the attenuation, which is the nature of how the light falls off. So this, um, this curve here, normally it's a straight line saying, as you move away from the light, you get an equal amount or equivalent amount of um, light losing. But by tweaking this attenuation, we can bend the curve to say, 
everything up to a certain point is within the light. And then once you hit a certain point, it falls off quickly. So that allows, um, oops, <laughs> look at that. That allows us to maybe not have the most realistic environment, but you kind of get this idea of being around the campfire within a certain distance is warm, it's bright, uh, it's comfortable. But as soon as you get a little bit out of the range of it, um, you're, you, this even um, amplifies the problem. As soon as you leave the range of the fire, it gets dark very quickly. So if I move this curve to be very sharp and just be a drop off, you can see it has a radius and we can see that it gets darker towards the end of the radius. But as soon as you hit that end of the attenuation there, which is exactly the point of the radius of this light, you get an immediate drop off. So we can tweak it again. Uh, I still think this here is pretty nice. Um, we're going to need to increase the radius, though, to really know. Um, and let's just say we're doing uh, something like this for now. Like I said, we're going to be tweaking this later. Um, so that gives us that. So the attenuation is also something we could tweak. So maybe we tweak range, attenuation, and energy. And we can do that. Now, the, atten the attenuation is going to be a tricky one. Um, I'd have to learn more about what is this attenuation, how can we modify it. I imagine it's some sort of a, a simple curve that we can mess with, but um, it looks like it can even be translated to a value, which is very nice. So um, with that, though, let's go back to our, our script here. So with creating a flickering light, excuse me, we're gonna want um, we're gonna want some sort of a a random. Uh, uh, a random jittering across the value. So if you were to just randomly add or remove value, it could be, uh, you know, over the long term, it would, have, it would probably average out, but it could be the case where the light slowly builds up and doesn't get darker again, or the light slowly gets darker and doesn't get bright again. So what we're gonna want, let's go back to paint. What we're gonna want is we're gonna wanna define a baseline and say, this is the standard value of say the um, the energy and when we actually have the, oh, when we actually have the line the light let's get my brush here we go we want the the light to do something like this where it's all based on the um, the baseline here but we kind of have variations above and below it so we don't stray too far from the good value but we still get some sort of um, some sort of uh, curve to it um, with some random values. Another thing is we, we want the value to be consistent. We don't want the value to look like this, do, 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 like, or maybe we do, you know, the intensity of that can be dependent. But if you have something that's just like back and forth really strong, that's gonna look really weird. Um, things naturally uh, grow and shrink uh, with some consistency. Uh, you're not gonna have super sharp uh, curves all the time. You're going to have, um, you know, depending on how the fire, the fire is roaring, you might see more like this. The fire is kind of dying down. You might see a little slower. So there's a, a good way to do that. And, um, you know, we can use basic noise, but that'll give you a random value from one to zero uh, anywhere across the line, which is going to be way too sharp. And we don't have a lot of control over that. Instead, in fact, we can even look at this in paint.net. We're going to want to use some nice noise. So even here we have, um, this is what random noise would look like. Not very good. We should be able to render some clouds though. Now clouds are a very common sort of noise. You can see that before we had a very sharp, let's add a new image. Before we had, with this one, if we just get just raw noise, and we'll do no color, 100% coverage, 100% intensity. We can see here that we just have a lot of very sharp values that jump. I mean, this is truly random. And, and you know, when people speak about random, this is usually what they what they mean. But what we want is stuff that's very comfortable. Now, if you imagine that these white and black values are um, part of the line, so let's draw an equivalent line. Um, where's my line tool? Brush. 
it's not it. Line tool. Let's say we're drawing, we're, we're visualizing the light across this line. Now, the value that we provide, oops, um, now let's do black brush and orange. The value of the light, we can then map to the lightness or darkness here. So let's say 50% gray would be the line. Pure black would be down here, I suppose. And pure white would be up here. Let's draw those lines as well. So let's say the 100% line is here and the 0% line is here. And that line in the middle is the 50% line. If we were to adjust our values according to this noise, we would have something that's a little lower here and then you know, centers out about here. And then here it's getting white, so it comes up a bit. And then goes middle and then here it's getting pretty white again and then drips back down. And then here it gets pretty dark and so on and so forth. For example, if we were looking at here, this would be something that spikes way down as we go across this line here. So this gives us a nice controlled noise that is very smooth. And you know, it's not truly random, but people don't want truly random. They want something that's nice. And the way that when I visualize a fire in my head, I think of flickering, but I, I think of it also being a little smooth. Now. This sort of noise is very fortunately something that Godot can handle. So we can, I think we can even do noise. Uh, no, there's no node for noise. So what we need to do is create our noise itself. So let's just say noise of our noise equals noise texture. So here's a noise texture. We're going to create something like this. Now, one thing to note is because we're doing a single um, element, like a single parameter, we don't need it to be two dimensional. All we really need is a single line of this smooth color that we then walk across. So we're gonna create a new noise texture and look at the documentation here. When we create a noise texture, um, it's using open, open simplex noise, which is uh, an implementation of this kind of noise. And we wanna be able to give it certain parameters. So um, see, uh, a couple, let's look, review these parameters. This is the width and height of the image. This is 800 by 600, defaults 512. Because we're looking at a, a, a line, we don't really care about the size of the image. We just want to make sure that we have enough values so it doesn't repeat too often. Speaking of repeating, we have seamless. Seamless means that when it reaches the end, it'll match the value at the beginning. So for example, if this was the end here, and let's just pull the value from it there, and then we jump all the way back to the beginning, if we compare these two values, we can see here that the value on the left side is much darker than the value on the right side. Um, if you were walking along this, reach the end of the texture and come back to the start, you would notice a jump. Um, and like I showed in here, that would look something like the brightness, oops, the brightness of it going from relatively bright to boom, relatively dark. So that's very noticeable. And once again, it is random, but people don't want random. They want something that they, uh, they like to look at. Actually, we'll keep this up temporarily. So if it's seamless, what it does is it makes sure that when it reaches this end, it matches the color and then smoothly transitions the lines um, back. So it's just a way to make sure that um, when you're looping over the same values, instead of having an infinitely long noise texture, you just loop over the same values. People won't really notice the loop if, if you're uh, careful enough with it. And there won't be any noticeable jump between the two. Um, you can also have as a normal map or bump strength. Uh, there's also uh, the noise element itself. This is the actual definition of um, the noise. So how um, how big the patches of white and black are, how smooth they move around. Um, I'm not going to explain too much about no, uh, simplex noise because it's, uh, there's a lot to talk about. But the general idea is you can configure just how sharp these clouds look. So I think if we render clouds, um, for example, I can scale it. We can see how we notice this pattern over again. I can make it rougher. See how you, it's fuzzier the less rough it is. 
and it's almost grainy the more rough it is um, but it, even though it is grainy and uh, pretty sharp you can still see obvious patches um, and areas where there is a transition it's just going to be more abrasive of a trans uh, transition and then of course you give a C. These are very basic parameters. The open simplex noise has even more for you to work with. But um, in general, we're just gonna, for right now, we're just gonna leave it at the base values. So that way we don't have to worry about finding it. So now we wanna get some values from the noise. So the noise texture that we made, let me specify the texture size. We keep my large size, it takes longer to generate. So we don't want large textures. Um, looks like it uses threads to generate the texture. So if you happen to generate a large texture, um, we want to make sure that we wait until the texture is ready. So here it says that um, we can load the texture. If we want to load a new texture, for example, we want to yield, uh, which is waiting for a signal saying that the texture is ready, and then we can pull uh, image data from that texture. So let's um, oh, let's go back to here. Let's go back to our script. So from here, let's just assume that it's loaded already. We want to say uh, set ener uh, set the energy. So we can do oh, and we want to set a few things. Um, energy our energy baseline. Oops, energy. The baseline for energy. Let's leave it what it is now. 0 0.7. Var. Um, and this could be const actually, because we don't really want to mess with it. Const and um, energy energy base and const uh, range base equals 7.7. .7. Like I said, we can tweak all this later. We can also do a thing where the user, when they're messing with the scene, instead of using a constant, we can grab, actually, let's just do that. Var, we can do on ready, means wait for the ready, and we'll set a var energy base equals, and then we'll just do self dot, um, uh, we're at omni light. Oh, we have omni range. Uh, let's just go to light. It's going to be light underscore energy. So light energy and on ready var. Um, this will be range base equals self dot omni range. So we now have a, the base staying from the omni um, range here. So we want to uh, flicker our light. So what we want to do for getting the energy is we're going to take our noise texture and we're going to pull a value from the noise texture um, and base it from that. So we want to also set those top and bottom ranges. So <coughs> to do that, we can be relatively simple and we can just do on ready of our energy range equals a vector two, two points. The X will represent the lower point and it'll be energy base. Um, and let's just say minus zero, or just minus one and ener self dot energy base plus one. So we're saying that the energy can range at max 8.7, or uh, maybe that's too big. Let's do point, point 0.2 and point 0.2 for the energy. Sorry, I was looking at the wrong one. So at max, it'll be point 0.9, and at minimum, it can be point 0.5. I don't know if those are good values or not, but we're just going to use them for now. And on ready var uh, range, <laughs> range range, which is a funny name, vector two, that'll be self dot range base minus one and self dot range base plus one. So once again, um, the range will go on average be around 7.7 .7, at a minimum 6.7 .7, at a maximum 8.7. .7. So now what we want to do is we want to pull a value from this noise texture. So let's do noise dot, um, let's see, it's probably in the tutorial the right way to do it. The width, height, seamless, oh, we do want it to be seamless. Um, 
So maybe when we do here, we want to do let's just do it. Um, how wide do we want it? Let's just do 100 wide or 300 wide, and let's just do 30 tall, just so there's a little space between them, because we're going to use or sorry, let's do 20 tall. Oh, let's do 30. Finally, we want the, oh, maybe we set them afterwards. Sorry, I, I haven't really used this specific noise texture in the past. And then self dot, oh, let's do, um, all right, I'm doing stuff that I shouldn't. All right, in here, let's do noise dot width equals 100 noise height equals 30 noise dot seamless equals true we want it to loop cleanly and oops let's just check one more thing do we care about bump strength normal map uh, if it's a normal map it'll have bump strength but we don't care strength of the bump maps using this texture yeah, we can mess with that later. And then this gives us uh, a noise instance, but um, we just want to get the noise currently. So um, we want to do noise dot noise. It has its own noise dot get, um, get some noise at a two dimensional uh, position. So um, we can do uh, energy uh, normal offset equals they get 2d vector at um, some position so the position is just going to be starting at zero zero and moving across so um, oops let's go back so for now let's just leave it consistent let's say it's at a vector two of the x is the the variable there, we'll just put it at 50 in the middle of the thing, and it's always going to be at the very top of it. Oops, R. Now that we have a value from 0 to 1, we then want to adjust that within the energy range. So we can now do um, var energy offset equals lerp, and then we're going to do a linear extrapolation from this, or interpolation, I guess. Uh, from the minimum value to the maximum value at the, the normal offset. So if we're going from, we're going to do energy range dot x, that's the lowest value, energy range, oops, energy range dot y, that's the maximum value, and then the percentage between that value is going to be the energy normal offset. So now we've picked a value from this lower value to the upper value that is the amount of white black or gray that that particular pixel is at finally we'll do self dot uh, omni or light energy equals uh, energy offset oops energy offset so now we can apply that energy offset now we can do basically the same thing, but instead of energy normal offset, we'll do range, and we'll do omni range. This one will be a uh, range range, which is uh, once again the silly one range range dot y, and then instead of using the energy normal offset, we'll do that, and then once again this is going to be uh, in the center of the x for now. We have 30 values of y to go with. So basically, instead of sampling from the top here, we're going to go down 30 pixels and sample from here. Now, it's going to be pretty similar. Um, that's useful because the intensity of the light and the amount of room that it covers is going to kind of grow and shrink together. But they're not going to be identical. So there will be a little bit of offset, which gives it a little bit more life. So um, we want them to move somewhat together but we don't want them to be exact copies. Um, likewise, if I chose a really big number, you could wind up something where the range gets high, but the energy gets very low. 
and that might be interesting it's something worth investigating but um, the further away from those values are depending on how this noise texture is generated you could get more intense differentials between the two so because it's a fire i just want it to look very nice and and grow and shrink together so we'll only move about 30 vectors away. We could even do zero vectors away and have them both sample the same offset so they grow and shrink together. Um, but we're just gonna offset it a little bit just to see how that looks. So as we run this scene, uh, oh, can I, uh, null instance of null instance. All right, I think I might have to um, do on ready bar noise equals a news noise texture. And then I also need to do noise dot noise equals um, open simplex noise dot new and we'll just generate a new open simplex noise with the default settings um, this is where we could tweak it to get the exact noise settings that we're interested in but just for now um, oh, I did something wrong for now we're gonna run this so looking at the remote let's take a look at the firelight we can see that our light, oh, where's my campfire? There we go. All right, so let's take a look and see what's going on. So the range is 0.02. It's being set to 0.02 every single time. May, it might be a case where the range is too low. Um, it could be that the energy, well, the energy's base is fine. Um, energy range, energy range, that looks annoying. try disabling this temporarily let's just rerun it and do one at a time so here's our scene once again let's add the range shifting and see how that affects it so here it looks like the range is getting way too small um, likewise I think if we switch it to just the energy let's see how that looks so here we're getting the energy it's different than the the base value and that's probably because these differences here are way too big. But the first thing we want to do now is see here that we have this, um, this value is always 50, which means it's not actually changing. It's always uh, sampling the same point. So let's do something else. Let's do um, var x position equals zero. Every frame, let's move the x position uh, we want it to say, let's say after a second, which would be, uh, actually, I think it's just going to be one. Uh, delta is how many seconds. So after one second, we want it to move all 100. So we want to do um, 100 times delta. That means that after a hundred se uh, one second worth of deltas, the x position will have uh, gotten more than that. And we want to do if x position is greater than 100 then we'll do x position equals uh, one, uh, x or we'll do x position minus equals 100 so it'll jump back to the uh, the original value and then instead of 50 let's just do x oops I forgot bar x position and x position and let's run it. Oh, we got something going on. Oh, that's because I didn't. Oh, no, it is fine. Sorry. Exposition, we want it to increase by um, 100 units over the course of one second. So really what this should be is 100 times 1 times delta, to be perfectly honest. And this 1 should be a variable. In fact, we can do this var um, flicker loop time equals, uh, let's say, 1 second for now. And we do flicker loop time. So it'll do it um, across that whole second. And the parentheses don't matter for this. So I'm running this with one second, and we can see already just how quickly and how um, intense that flickering is. Um, what we could do is, since we increase the loop time, let's say to 10 seconds, let's run it again. Oh, I got it backwards. Um, so 
this should be 100 divided the loop by the loop time times the delta. And now, very slowly, it's flickering around. This requires a lot of tweaking, but now we kind of have this living, breathing fire as we walk around. Um, we also noticed that it had a bit of a jump there as it loops. See that? That's because um, we're doing a simple, like our, our, I'm imagining it's because our deltas here aren't perfect. Uh, it could also be another issue. May just be, maybe the seamless isn't as seamless as we'd like. Either way, um, we can worry about that later. But we're knowing a couple of things already. The energy is too intense. And I think the range needs to be uh, much smaller. And then this, oh, here's why. Add the energy offset. This should be the range offset. So now we can go back, run it, and now we kind of have our campfire. It's moving just a little bit. The range of it uh, producing light on our environment is different. We can see at some points the tree gets almost uh, invisible. And then later, once the fire picks up, uh, up again, we can see the tree. So we kind of have our breathing fire. Um, this is great. It adds a lot of um, ambiance to our scene. The uh, real, really the only tweaks is kind of figuring out why that little jump is happening. But also we need to figure out um, what is the best noise to have? What is the best speed across that noise? What are the best uh, maximum and minimum values? Should we uh, do any other tricks to make this light uh, act the way that we want? Um, not only that, our scene is pretty dark outside of there. So um, we could do something like in the world environment, you know, it's not gonna be pitch black. We're gonna have a really dark moonlight. So, oh, that's way too intense. Uh, let's make the energy really low. In fact, I can go to the scene and find out. Um, so as we mess with the scene, go to the world environment. Oops, world environment. And, oh, we need, uh, it doesn't work so well on the remote. It's because it does funny stuff. Um, let's make it, uh, see that's way too intense. Either way, there's a lot of stuff we can play with. We can add some fog to the scene, uh, depending on how we want it to look. Um, there's a lot of visual tweaking that can be done alongside this light here um, to make it work. I mean, <laughs> even if something as simple as tweaking the ambient light, well, now you kind of have this weird glowing campfire, but it's everything is so drowned out by the power of the midnight sun that um, we're going to run into trouble with. Um, the visuals if we're not careful. Um, we can do a sky, we can give it a sky texture here. I think that's pretty bright. Anyway, um, this isn't gonna be something where I cover the sky. We don't wanna worry about that right now. Um, but there's gonna be um, a lot of cool stuff we can do here um, to play around with it. I know one of the things we like to have is a, a lake. So we could have uh, a sky set up where there's, uh, say, the moon or some stars are reflecting off of the lake. Um, so I think that'll that'll look really cool. But for now, we're just going to turn this ambient sun down to um, little to no contribution. And we might even change it where instead of having um, any sort of a sun, maybe we can change the alpha glow. Nope. Uh, instead of a sun, we can just creatively position some lights around, you know, spotlights, more omni lights. We can even, instead of using this environment, we can add a new light, uh, just gonna be a directional light. So instead of the sun, it's gonna be the moon. Um, its position doesn't matter. Its rotation is affected on everything. So maybe we have the moon um, shining light down on us from far away. The light is a very dull, very dark gray. You know, how bright we want it. We can tweak the energy of it. Um, once again, I don't know what the indirect energy is doing. If it's, oh, indirect energy. Oh, 
All right, so this is indirect energy that's for bouncing light around if you have a more complex uh, light map, but we have a pretty simple one. You go from there. So there's one last thing I kind of wanted to show off. So we have our light. Oh, yeah, we don't need this in here. We can leave it there. We have our light attached to the campfire. As we're previewing it in the editor, we're not seeing that flickering that we worked so hard on. So what we're going to do is we're going to give this thing the tool property, which means that when we... Um, I think I have to click off of the scene and come back. Maybe have to close it, relaunch it. Um, yeah, now that even in the editor, we're seeing the light shift around. See that? So now we don't even have to run the scene. The light is kind of living in the editor, so it's even easier for us to um, go ahead and um, make modifications to the scene and, and um, iterate on that much quicker without having to uh, see too much about what's going on here. So, all right, with that, I think I'm done with this little video. Um, but we're, we're beginning to make some good steps towards building the scene. So it's already one o'clock in the morning almost. Uh, tomorrow we're going to spend a lot of work on adding the slight more features, such as picking things up and making the fire go. But other than that, um, there's going to be a lot of work on the visuals of this to make it look the way that we that we want to. So with that, thanks for watching and uh, stay tuned for the next uh, portion of this.